This is Can I Laugh on Your Shoulder? Welcome to Can I Laugh on Your Shoulder? I'm Molly Stillman, and this is a podcast where each week we have raw, funny, often brutally honest conversations about the things that matter most, our faith, our businesses, our lives, and everything in between, where we each learn how to be good stewards of the things we've been entrusted with, even our stories, and how we can use those things to serve others and leave our families, our friendships, and our communities a little better than we found them. I want to create a space where people are unafraid to be themselves and unafraid to ask the questions the rest of us are thinking. My goal is to make you laugh, cry, and laugh till you cry. My guest this week is Jason Van Roller. He is the author of Get Past Your Past, How Facing Your Broken Places Leads to True Connection. He began his career in 2011 and has worked with a ton of different populations over the years, ranging from persons who are incarcerated to top CEOs, performers, and artists, and just about everyone in between. Jason has extensive experience as a clinician, coach, and speaker, and operates a multi-state private practice. And in 2018, Jason joined Bethesda Workshops in Nashville, Tennessee, where he serves as a group leader and facilitator. He's known for his ability to relate and connect with his clients and offer hope to those who have felt hopeless. He has an engaged and rapidly growing online audience. You may have come across his reels on Instagram where he shares short videos sharing practical tips for psychological care, self-help, and healthy relationships. This is such a good episode. I loved my conversation with Jason. We really dive deep into the journey of healing from our pasts and how challenging that can be, how we find uh, courage to be vulnerable with people around us, how it is really important to feel it, to heal it. We get deep in this episode. We get deep in this conversation. I know you're going to love it. So without further ado, I'm going to get out of your way and we're going to go on the conversation with Jason Van Ruler. Jason, welcome to the show. I'm so pumped to have you here. Thanks for being here and taking time out of what I know is probably like pretty busy schedule right now. I'm not really doing anything. I've just been <laughs> hanging out. This is this is the only thing I have today. You're I'm like, just, I uh, love it. Yeah, it's been it's just like a vacation. No, it's been a busy season, but I'm I'm honored to be on. This is awesome. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I always like to tell people, tell my guests who have a book that have just released or have a book coming out or are working on a book. Um, I like to just give you a personal round of applause because I know how much work goes into it. And um, congratulations on your book that comes out uh, here in a, a little less than a month by the time this airs. Yeah. I'll get past your past. We're going to dive into all of that. But before we do that, you know what time it is, Jason. It's Jason 101 <laughs> time. I don't know why I felt like I needed to say that. Like we needed a like let's it. get ready to rumble. I think I'm going to disappoint you. I mean, you built it up a little too much and now no. I'm going to I'm going to take it down a notch. You but can't, no, you can't disappoint that's, us. That's, that's just... my favorite time. Jason <laughs> um, time is my favorite yeah, time. Yeah, J- Jason this is great. Jason 101. Bring it on. Yes. Well, um Thank you for that. I I think the, you know, uh, the overview is I'm a therapist that also does um, speaking and has written a book. And so I do a lot of retreats also. And so just kind of all those things and do some coaching. I wrote a book. The book is coming out um, in addition to that. So that's all good professional stuff. Um, I'm also a father uh, to three kids and a husband. And I think, um, you know, for me, just to tell you a little bit about myself and my story, uh, I have a story that I think at one time was kind of unusual that that maybe is unfortunately more commonplace, but uh, just come from a broken home where there was a lot of trauma and chaos and abuse and addiction and kind of all those things. And, you know, got through that and just swore to myself I'd be different. Mm. And I don't know if you can relate to that, but it's oh, like, yeah. well, I'm seeing this. I just know I'll never do that, Hmm. right? That'll just never happen. And boy, I wanted to believe it. And I really did mean it when I say it or said it. Um, But at that time, uh, what happened is I I launched into adulthood 
And I didn't know how to do it the way I wanted to do it. I just knew I wanted to do it differently. And so kind of like a lot of people, if you don't know how to do it differently, you return to what you know. Ooh. And within a couple of years, I just sort of built the life I was running from. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, I'm going to show you because it's going to be crazy different. And then, you know, four years later, five years later, I'm like, I really showed you because I replicated it. Mm -hmm. And I was walking through my apartment at the time. And it was just like one of those days where I had just done all the wrong things. And I knew it. I felt really bad. And I caught this kind of reflection of myself in the mirror. And I actually just had like this very, this kind of visceral, like I want to just keep walking. Like I didn't even want to look at it. There was just this like, oh, okay. And I think I just had this realization that like, if I don't somehow figure some of this out, like I, I already know how to predict the rest of my life. Like I, I know exactly how it's going to go, how I'm going to feel, what I'm going to do. And I just thought like, man, I don't think I want that, but I also don't know how to get out of it. Mm. And so um, I would tell you that I'd like to say everything changed that day. And so this is, you know, I looked in the mirror and I saw that. And then the next day I was awesome. Well, plot twist, I was always awesome, but it was not awesome for a long time. I just started to ask some questions and do some work. And along the way, became a therapist because it became really important to me. And, and I feel like my life's work to help other people kind of walk through some of that stuff and build the thing they really want. Mm, man, I feel like that, let's call it 120 second introduction. You just spoke the lives of, of some people. Um, and I know you said it, how you thought for a while it was pretty unique and how more often than not, you're finding that that's not actually unique. I think what, what actually was unique and what made you or what made you at one time think it was unique is the fact that people didn't talk about it as much. Yeah. Um, and I think that that has really been a positive shift in our culture in the last, I don't know, 15, maybe 20 years, maybe. But there's been a shift where it's there's been more encouragement and acceptance to go, you know, seek help to get counseling to talk about these things, to break those to actually break those generational curses, those generational traumas um, that so many of us, you know, have experienced and some people haven't. And that's amazing. But it was, it's just so fascinating that and that this and kind of what you're talking about is a very common, I just I feel like a common theme that I've talked to a lot of guests about in the last year. Um, I even I have an interview coming up next week um, with uh, my good friend Ike Miller, whose book comes out this month called Good Baggage, and lo really mm. looking at how your childhood trauma can impact positive relationships as an adult. And so it's it, but it's this common theme of all right, here's reality is this life is hard. And for many, not all, but again, for many, childhood trauma is a real thing. Um, and it, they're going to be varying levels. We, we can get into the nuances of all of those things. But it's then, um, and I know that this is so much of what your heart is, is it's not forgetting that those things happened. It's not just like, well, let's just pretend like life wasn't hard. Or let's just pretend like that stuff didn't happen. It's okay. Here's reality. Here's what happened. Here is this traumatic thing that I went through. How do you then take those experiences and use them to move in the direction of a better future? And so I know that that is, is, is your heart and really the heart behind this book. Um, and so I say all of that to just say that you know, at what point for you, because you said that it wasn't like a you looked in the mirror and everything changed. At what point for you did it really begin to change? Or was there a, a, a light bulb moment? Or was it more kind of just slowly over time as you began to actually dig in and do work? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think the struggle was, you know, that day I kind of I started to make a decision to just at least be a little bit honest with myself about where I was at. And I think that opened the door to change. And, and then, you know, somehow in my mind, I thought, well, OK, so whatever has happened, my job is just to get over that and then everything will be great. Mm. And so I really held on to that. But then what happened is I, I met the love of my life and we tried to have children. And all of a sudden we started to have these issues. We had miscarriages. And so we started to have these big problems that you're not supposed to have more problems. Right. So if your job is to like get over your childhood, then you should just get over that and then everything's great. 
And so I think when it all started to change was when I learned that it wasn't to like get over one moment, but it was to learn how to process it in a real time and keep going. Mm -hmm. And that for me took a while because I just kept thinking like, well, if I just dealt with that one thing, like that would be it. And it was more of like a maintenance thing than it was a one-time deal. Mm. All right. So I know that, um, and feel free to say, I will not be answering that question. Next question, please. Sure. I, I because I, I always like to say that I ask the questions that other people are thinking. Um, so I know that we can, we can speak in generalities. I'm curious for you, like what were the things that, you know, and you don't, again, you don't have to go into super detail with your childhood and, and, but you know, you said that there were a lot of things that were unhealthy that you said, my adulthood's not going to be like that. Can you kind of give us some examples of some things that maybe, you know, you really, when you came into adulthood that you were like, I'm not going to do this. And you immediately found yourself doing the thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm happy to, you know, to touch on some of those different things. Um, so I think what happened is that uh, when my parents divorced, it just kind of ripped a hole through the middle of everything. Yeah. And so there was a lot of financial instability. Yeah. There was a lot of fighting. Um, there was emotional abuse taking place, physical abuse taking place, just really an inability to manage the circumstances and manage pain. And and the problem was that in doing that and trying to cope with really the hard things that were happening, it just actually created more. Mm. And so for me, it was like, this, this is the thing that I see could be anticipated and we could have avoided. But I felt like as a kid, I was on the receiving end of that. Mm. And so I received all the bad stuff that came from that. And, and so that was, you know, it was things like emotional and physical and sexual abuse even. Um, and, and I just felt like, man, if someone were paying more attention, if someone were actually dealing with this, I probably wouldn't have been collateral damage. Mm. That for me was the thing like, I just don't, I don't want to create that. I don't want to create right. a life in which there's just kind of this wake of people and places behind me that have been wounded by my woundedness. And, and so that for me was really the catalyst to how, how do I, how do I make sure I don't do this to somebody else? And, and that's why I think it was such a disappointing moment when I kind of had that realization I was doing that. Mm, yeah, that's, I think that that speaks actually perfectly into the next question I wanted to ask. And that is um, one of the things that you really touch on in the book, and I think you do so well, is um, you have a chapter that is entitled Feel It to Heal It. And you really emphasize the importance in feeling the feelings, facing grief head on, not shying away from pain, loss, sorrow, brokenness, all of those things. And I think that there's also a tension of when we are in those times where we feel those feelings that are on the negative end of the spectrum, um, that we can not also feel positive feelings at the same time. And so, um, you, you talk a lot about this, that you have to feel it in order to heal it. And that runs the gamut, that runs the spectrum of emotions. Um, but that is really difficult. And I say this as somebody who has lived this. And, you know, when my mom died my senior year of high school, I did not deal with it. I didn't go to counseling. I didn't go to therapy. I didn't talk about it. I shut down. And needless to say, um, I did not work to heal from that until many, many years later. And that uh, it, it wasn't until I was well into adulthood where I was like, oh, that may not have been the, the healthiest approach <laughs> to just not dealing with it. So I, I, I speak from experience. Then when I was faced with more grief, when I was in my, uh, I was 33, when we lost two pregnancies. And when I went through that, it was a very clear moment that I heard from God of, you have two choices here right now. You can either run from me and run from your emotions, um, which you've done before. And that ended you in a very deep, dark pit. Or you can run towards me. You can run and you can face this head on and you can deal with it so that you can heal with heal it. So anyway, I, I 
preface that to then ask you this is why is this so crucial for people, but also why is it so difficult? Um, because it is such a common thing that I talk to a lot of people who are facing grief, facing difficulty, facing challenges um, from currently or in the past where they just are like, not, nah, I'm just not gonna, not gonna deal with it. Not gonna face it. If I don't deal with it, if I don't face it, then it, everything's fine. Didn't happen. Right. Right. Um, I would just say, first and foremost, I'm so sorry that happened. Thank I you. mean, those are really difficult things. Yeah. Just one of those, let alone both of those. And, and so I totally get and, and can relate to not wanting to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And I think nobody wants to hurt, you know, yeah. uh, if I said to you like, hey, look at your calendar and schedule schedule the time you'd like to feel hurt. Uh, nobody wants to do that. that. That's not a great question. And yet I think, you know, when you bring up, you know, your relationship with God, like I think God actually meets us in those places. Oh, for sure. Uh, and that's not to say that, you know, we should rush out and, and try to break our life up and say, well, I'm chasing God by ruining everything. And yet. I think when we do feel those things, we, we are met in, in this place that that we don't have otherwise. Mm -hmm. I, I think the challenge to go there is it feels like we might lose control. It is super vulnerable to do that because we don't really know what's going to come out and we don't know to what intensity or even necessarily what we'll do with that sometimes. And so I think just the the proposition of just feeling it it just feels oh, so risky. I mean, and it feels almost a little reckless. Like if mm -hmm. you've got really powerful emotions, it's like, well, where will that lead me? Will that change everything? If I do that, will I be the same person? Can I actually do this and keep it contained? And and I think those are all reasonable things to think. Um, and yet, if we don't lean into that, uh, what happens is it ends up powering some of our decisions going Oof. forward. And, and so we say, well, I'm, I'm not going to deal with it. I'm not going to look at it. And it's like, well, okay, but it's still in there. Um, and so your refusal to look at it doesn't mean it went away. Mm -hmm. I love that you touched on the reality of the, the fact that, that doing this requires vulnerability. It requires um, often exposing an open wound and... I know that another one of the things you talk a lot about that in order to heal that open wound or in order to heal, not only do you have to face it, do you have to, you know, feel it to heal it, but you have to also bring other people into the equation, whether that is seeing a licensed counselor, whether that is um, maybe confiding in a trusted friend or a spouse or, um, you know, it's a variety of things, but that is really, uh, you know, for some people that part might be easy. Um, but I would say for a lot of people, bringing people, bringing someone else into the most vulnerable pieces of your life is, it can be terrifying. And uh, I know that one of the things that you kind of, you touch on is what you refer to as, um, I believe it's it smart vulnerability mm -hmm. and how you can f look for characteristics of a person that you can be, you know, it, it can be deemed safe and you can be vulnerable with. What how do, if somebody is really struggling with this, how might they do that? Yeah, I, well, I think it's so important because what happens is that oftentimes when we have some things that we're dealing with, we as part of that, we we have some part where we felt rejected or we felt that someone didn't meet us For in that sure. space. For and sure. so if that was in childhood, what, what we can tell ourselves is um, if someone really knew me, they'd never love me. Or if someone really heard who I am or how I felt bad things that happen or it'd be too much or not enough. And so, so I think the reason I have this in there is because then the tendency is, okay, well, I've never shared this with anybody. So now I'm going to just pick a person and share it with, and I'm going to tell them everything and see what they do. And so the danger is if we pick an unsafe person and, or even just a person who's unavailable or unwilling and we get rejected, we've now confirmed this belief that we had, mm -hmm. which is, see, now I had my kind of one one last ditch effort to try to trust somebody and tell them everything, and they rejected me, and see, this is why I don't do that. And, and the problem with it is you kind of set yourself up to fail mm -hmm. if you didn't identify what makes them the right person for that in the first place. 
because not everyone's going to be. And it's it's just because uh, not everyone's going to be in a place where they can or will or want to. And so if we can, you know, kind of incrementally trust them with some of this and make sure that they're a person who's willing and able and, and wants to receive that, we're going to have such a higher likelihood that this is helpful uh, as opposed to facing some of these messages of rejection. Mm. Okay. So if, if somebody's really on the, let's, let's call it the ground floor of this and they're just like, it. Yep. all right, I'm on the ground floor. I'm ready to step onto the elevator. The metaphor could get lost here, but we're going to go with it. <laughs> we're going to um, run with it. We're yeah. going to run with this. It's sometimes words come out of my mouth and I'm like Michael Scott and I just hope I find myself <laughs> along the way. Um, That's great. Sometimes I start a sentence and I don't know where it's going. I just hope I find myself along the way. Um, <laughs> So you have somebody who's like on the ground floor, they're looking to get on the elevator. <laughs> How do you begin this process of finding that person who maybe is, is they can be vulnerable with? Where does somebody start? Especially, oh man, we could go off on a whole tangent about this, but I won't because I actually just talked about this in a podcast episode a couple weeks ago, um, is especially if they're lonely. And a pan they're yeah. they're really in the pandemic of loneliness because that's a whole nother like I feel like you have to address that before you address the other thing. So in any event, ground floor, where do they start? Yep. Not the elevator. Yeah. Not, not the, the elevator. elevator. So Let's so we're steps. gonna be healthy and we're gonna take the stairs. Yeah, yeah we're, we're gonna, gonna take, take the, stairs. the stairs. We just start yeah, we just start with step one. You're wearing your Apple Watch and you're trying to close your rings. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. The analogy is you're just I'm, doing I'm really working at one. it here, Jason. You're doing a good job. <laughs> but but you're highlighting there is there oh, yeah. is no elevator. Yeah. There's only steps. Okay. I love so it. the very first thing we do is take the very smallest step. And so that might just be when I think in my head about who I know either in an organization or friendship or mentor role or just colleague or anybody, who do I know that answers the phone? Mm, okay, well, let's just start right. there. Uh, well, here's 10 people that would answer the phone if I called. Okay, of those 10 people, who do I suspect would have any ability to listen to what I'm I'm wanting to tell them? Right. Who, who would meet me for coffee? Who would talk with me? Um, who do I think? Okay, well, that's narrowed that list down to three people. Okay, well, I'm going to talk to those three people. And I'm going to tell them initially, just kind of generally where I'm at. I'm going to I'm going to just float a little bit honesty in the sense that um, I'm not doing great. I'm at the ground floor and I'm taking step one. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to see what they do with that. Now, some people might say, hey, good to know. Um, did you see the game the other night? Okay, that's probably not my person. Some people might say, well, yep, life is hard. You just have to get over it. Probably not my person. Yeah. And someone might say, I am so sorry to hear that. Do you want to talk about it? That's your person. Mm. And so we're going to have to go through this a little bit before we find that person. Um, but we have to qualify that as opposed to trying to make someone who isn't into our person. That will preach. Um, yeah, because that, uh, yeah, I, I definitely have had those experiences with people. And um, it's interesting, like hearing you say that, and then I can't help but like self reflect on, um, you know, my my deep, dark pit and how I was was self protective of of feeling like, well, if people really knew what was going on, if people really knew the truth about how I got myself into this situation, then they're going to leave me. They're going to judge me. They're going to abandon me, whatever it is. And then when I did, you know, choose to let a person or two in, you know, I had, there were people who had rejected me or who had made me feel judged or, oh my gosh, I can't believe you did that or something, you know, said something to that effect, which is like real, you know, not great when super you're in that. Helpful. Super, super helpful. Because that's what you're looking for. Ultimately, that's, yeah. that's what you're wanting to yes. hear when you tell someone. Yeah. Exactly. And then, um, but then it's interesting how you're like, there's no elevator. And like, now that I'm thinking, about, I'm like, there is though, is like, uh, you know, I did heal over time. And now I'm like, you know what I should just do is now just tell everyone in the form of a book. So that is just great. <laughs> Um, I, it's just I fantastic, you know, yes. is, is, you know, I didn't tell a lot of people for a long time. So now I'm just going to tell thousands of people, um, which, you know, maybe millions when it's a Me too. New York times hey, best, bestseller. I know. <laughs> I think it ought to be, but I, I'm completely with you. It's like, well, now yeah. I've practiced this, but if I could just yeah. highlight, you make such, such a good point, which is that 
how how we think of it and speak of it initially changes over time. For sure. Because our relationship with it changes. Yeah. Some of the stuff I'm telling you today, you're telling me today, maybe a decade ago, we could have barely eked out. Oh, for sure. Barely said that. Um, and now today we can say, hey, yeah, this is part of my story. Yeah. And so I think how that looks changes over time. And, exactly. and eventually, uh, I don't know if everybody writes a book. We do, apparently. Yeah, but, apparently. But eventually, <laughs> we're, we, we have a relationship where there's some distance in between us and the story. And we see it differently. Yeah. And I think, too, it speaks to your... Um, your your emphasis on self-compassion and self-acceptance in overcoming past brokenness um where there are things that you know from my story that happened you know at this point you know 8 17 to 20 years ago and it's funny how in some ways like a lot of those things I'm like that happened that long ago and then also feels like it was yesterday um yeah but where some of it, I still, I mean, in the, I'd say I've done the most fully, and I think this was God's kindness to me. Um, I had felt the call and the, the, the draw to write a book for a long time, 10 plus years. Um, I got saved in September of 2010 and it wasn't really, it was really in that journey and in that process that I was like, I think I'm supposed to write about this. Um, but I didn't know what that looked like. And then I, started my book proposal in the summer of 2017. So by the time my book releases in March, you know, it will have been, uh, you know, I've talked about this a few times on the podcast recently, but it, and math is hard. Um, you know, it'll be basically almost eight years. Maybe it's not eight years. I don't know. Math is hard. Y'all don't judge me. My friend the other day was like laughing at me because she was like, wow, you really are very bad at math. And I was like, yes, it's, it's a chronic issue. Thank you. Thank you for noting Thank that. Thank you for I noting that. It. And yeah. I actually am confident enough at this point in my life to be like, yeah, no, it's not my strength. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and like, you know, try to pretend that Let's it not isn't. pretend. Yeah. We're not going to pretend that it isn't. Um, in any event, it'll be a while since I started working on the proposal. But what's really interesting is it really wasn't until about the year 2020 where I really began, I think, the final one of the final steps in my own healing journey. And that was the the part of self forgiveness. Um, mm. Because I had come to know that I had, you know, known and believed in my heart that God had forgiven me for my behavior and choices that I made. Um, I had made amends with people in my life that I'd hurt and apologized and asked for their forgiveness. Yet I was still carrying a lot of of unforgiveness towards myself. There was a lot of times where I would do the shoulda, coulda, wouldas in my head where I would be like, oh, but what would my life look like if I hadn't done X, Y, Z, or if I had done this differently, or if I'd done that differently. And that you can go to a very dark place in your own head very quickly. Mm -hmm. And it really was the kindness of God where I was just doing a like daily Bible reading and I heard as clear as I could, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit just say to me, like, if I can forgive you, like, who are you to not forgive yourself? And it was one of those like real convicting Holy Spirit moments where you're like, oh, you're right. You know, I'm sorry like, that that didn't come through. I didn't hear that. What, what was that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Where you're like, and and he's like, um, I'm the creator of the universe. And if I can forgive you, then you can forgive you. And that was a light bulb moment for me. But in that process, um, that is really, I think, why I've been able to get to where I am today, to when my book comes out and all of, you know, not all of it, but let's say the majority of my junk is now for public consumption. Um, I'm in a much more secure place with it. And I'm in a much better place where, I can face, you know, that there are going to be people that are going to not receive it well. There are going to be people that are going to judge it. There are going to be people that are going to be like, well, this story is boring, whatever. But I'm at a much better place now where I'm like, it is what it is. And I, I pray, my prayer is, is at this point is that if my sharing my vulnerability, sharing my story can help even one person maybe come to know the Lord or come to know Jesus a little bit better or maybe learn to forgive themselves 
then I've been obedient to what God's told me to do and called me to do. And, and that's all I can do. So, um, and I think that, you know, based on just even what you've said today is I feel like you can, you could probably say the same thing. Yeah. Well, I'm just so grateful you're sharing your story and, and I love that outlook and I have a similar one of, I'm doing this to help people. And so I recognize that in doing that, there will be, there will be some mess. There will be, you know, some people who love it and don't love it. And that'll all be part of the deal. I think, you know, we all struggle with self-forgiveness and and it's interesting because I I think if we asked most people, does everyone deserve forgiveness? They would say, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, we would just say, yeah, absolutely. And so a question I'll often ask my clients that I think really annoys them is, um, so everyone else deserves forgiveness and they'll say yes. And I'll say, so when did that stop being true for you? Ooh, ooh, well. uh, Yeah. So (laughs) it gets real quiet. Real quiet. Uh, And then I tell them that's what I want to talk about is I want to talk about that moment because there is a moment that that you that no longer applied to you. And let's start there Mm -hmm. and let's talk about what happened, because there those moments that we hold on to and we hold them too tightly, but we hold on to them that prevent us from going there with ourselves. What would you say that in working with your clients and in working with people over the years, Have you found a common thread between them for people who struggle with forgiveness? Because I would say, um, I just, I feel like I hear this kind of regularly and I'd be curious from your perspective, like, is there something that tends to hold us back from being able to forgive? Yeah, I think sometimes in a funny way, we we think we're honoring the people we hurt by hanging on to it. Ooh, and, and it is actually not as honoring as we think. Um, but I always agreed with that. I always thought, yeah, if you hurt somebody, you, you have to not forgive yourself so you remember you hurt them. And this was true for me. And then I, I started, I had part of my career where I worked with uh, a lot of victims uh, of crimes and just terrible, awful things. And so I would work with them. And I, I would always kind of have this sense of like, you probably want the person who did this to you to die, right? And what surprised me so much is over and over and over again, I kept hearing, why would I want that? That's just the worst thing that could happen. What I want, Jason, is I want them to get better and live a better life. So there's some meaning to this. Mm. And it was shocking to me because, again, I knew I had my own stuff and I was like, I know I've hurt people and I have to keep I have to keep this candle lit for this pain that I caused them um, because that's what they want. And then to hear people who have been really, really hurt in major ways say, why would I want that? Like Mm -hmm. that, that actually ruins everybody's life. Then it really made me look at it differently. And and so I think the best way we can honor the people we hurt is, is by being better. And we can't be better if we, if we don't forgive ourselves because people don't improve what they don't value. Oof. Yeah. That's really, um, that's, keep That's a quote that put that on a shirt. People can't improve what they don't value. Um, All right. So if there is is a t-shirt, it's $19.99 on the website. You uh, can, you can purchase. No, I'm just kidding. I love it. Wow. I was actually for a moment for just a split second, Jason, (laughs) we're going to make this happen. You really had me going for a a millisecond. And I was like, I'm that's wow. I'm impressed. Let's do it. Um, Yeah. Copyright 2023. What year is it? I don't know. Um, (laughs) Yeah, but that's so good. And it's such an, like I said, such an important, I think, piece of this puzzle in how we, because the re, just the fact of the matter is, is that any kind of, you know, at the root of what we've been talking about is like any kind of difficult childhood trauma or just hurt, brokenness in our past. The reality is, is that, there are other people involved. Like just, you're gonna, I would love if there is somebody listening who's like, no, I have some childhood trauma and I am the only person that is in the equation. If that is you send me an email because I want to hear your story. Um, because we are just, we're interconnected people. God created us to be in community where he created us to be in relationship with other people. But as we know, we live in a broken world. Um, we live in a post fall world and until Jesus comes on back, 
um, which regularly I'm like, all right, Jesus, come collect us. Um, is today the day? Is I'm today ready. the day? Could you just come collect your people? We are unwell. <laughs> um, you know, until that happens, you know, there's going to be pain and there's going to be brokenness, but there's also going to be joy and there's going to be laughter. And those things can coexist. They do not have to be mutually exclusive. You cannot tell me that those things, you know, have to be mutually exclusive. Um, but like I said, it's just, there's always going to be other people involved in the equation. And, um, if there is somebody who is, you know, just listening to this and they're, they're again, they're kind of on that, um, on that ground level, or maybe they're just a couple of steps up. Do you have any like specific action steps that they can take to begin, um, one, maybe a journey of forgiveness or, or of, of, of someone else or of themselves, or, um, if it's, if that's not it, how to just take that next step in their, their journey to, of healing, like what, you know, cause figuring out is forgiveness the first step or is it actually something else? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think it's going to vary a little bit depending on where we're at. And and so certainly some people I bet would hear this and they'd say, well, I'm I'm too much. I'm not enough. Right. Mm -hmm. So I yeah, I've got some hurt, but it, uh, it's not not like that bad. So maybe. Oh, maybe we not. do the or comparison I, I thing. Way, oh, no, yeah. We the, never do that. We yeah. never do that. Or like I've no. got my stuff, but it's not as bad as this or 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 uh, your stuff isn't as bad as. my. Oh, yeah, we totally do that. We all do that. We totally do that. So so I think for us, the first step is just to be honest about what that stuff is and if we can live with it. Hmm. So, so okay, whatever that stuff is, before we do the thing that we do where it's too much or not enough, what if we just, and we can, we can pray it, we can write it, we can say it, we, whatever that is, but to just literally be honest with ourselves about what's really going on. Hmm. That step is key because that allows us to start to get some help and information along along the lines of what we actually need. So so if you're in a place where you say, yeah, I'm fighting with my spouse all the time. And what what's the honest truth? Okay, what's the honest truth? Well, I know I'm fighting with them all the time, but the honest truth is our marriage is really hard. And I don't know if it's going to work. Mm. Like that's that is the honest truth is um, I'm really angry and I'm in a I'm in a place where I, I don't know. I don't know. And I'm not very invested. Okay. That that's hard, but then that's, that's the honest truth we can start with. So then if I know that, where do I, where would I guess to go to get some help with that? Could I, could I search it online? Could I contact a therapist? Could I talk to a pastor? Could I talk to a mentor? What, what is the easiest way to start down the path of getting some information about what to do next? But what I find is if we're not honest with ourselves first, we end up kind of doing that thing where we package it up a little nicer than it is. And then we don't even get the help we need. Mm. Ooh, you package it up a little nicer than it is. And we don't get the help we need. Man, that is, you got some, you got some preaching moments here, Jason. Um, yeah, that's that's such a good perspective. And um, I think really can be it's it's challenging. But you know, I always like to use that. Um, clearly, I like analogies. Um, but I always like that analogy of like, you know, if, if you want to get in shape, what do you have to do? Like you have to go to the gym and you have to if in order to get stronger, what do you have to do? You have to lift heavier weights. Um, mm -hmm. Is it going to be easy? It's not. Are you going to probably grunt and scream a little bit? Probably. Um, but you, in order to build up your muscles, you have to literally break them down. And so it's, I, I think it's kind of a, the perfect just picture of in order to heal from something and in order to build up our spiritual muscles, build up our mental and emotional muscles, we have to break them down a little bit and it's going to take some work. There's going to be some crying and some grunting and it's going to, it's going to require <laughs> sacrifice. Like it's just the reality of it. We're just going to be like, Aah! you know, I remember if you, if you want to be better, you don't have to be. I mean, yeah. so that's the good news is right. Um, Correct. when you write that thing down, Maybe you say like, yeah, I think my marriage is failing. Um, and then you say, but I can live with that. Mm. And the cost is I just don't say anything. And, you know, Jason, I think I can live in that space. Well, OK. I it's mean, I'm not choice. I'm not here to, to yeah, to tell you. So I, I think it's just really saying, well, if if I say that I want better then this is the cost and am I willing to do that? If I want to get stronger, I have to lift heavier weights. I can have all kinds of feelings about that. And those are fine. But what's true is true. Mm. So am I willing to do it or not? Mm. 
man. Oh, this is so good. I, uh, I feel like I say this a lot lately, but I've just had, you know, just, I love, I love talking to really smart, brilliant people. Um, I could talk to you for like another three hours about this. Uh, cause I think it's really <laughs> fascinating, but because I always like to, uh, you know, I, again, I, I talked about, I love living in the tension of the grief and the joy and the sorrow and the, the glee and the pain and the healing. I, I, I love both sides of those coins. Um, so could you, as we, since we're running out of time, if, you know, to leave us a word of encouragement for if there is somebody listening who, who feels like they are having a hard time seeing the end of the light at the end of the tunnel and seeing that healing is possible. And I mean, and I feel like maybe you and I sharing our collective stories, I think hopefully gives people hope of like, oh, okay, I don't have to stay stuck in this dark place for long. And, you know, and even now I could, I probably would bet money that you could say this as well is that there are times, you know, where I've been on the other side of the, the healing journey and other hard stuff has come up. Like God did not promise an easy life. Uh, I have certainly it's like just when I thought I figured it out, here comes just something else. what I thought, you know, and, and we, you know, had some things that happened in our lives this spring that just there were there were times where I was looking up at God going like really are you going to throw one more thing my way like could could you not um and it just and it just kept getting thrown my way um but I think that because I now have the tools in my metaphorical tool belt I feel like I dealt with it and handled it a little bit differently than I probably would have in the past um and I think it could just be maybe I attribute it to stronger spiritual muscles that I've been able to build over the course of a couple of decades. Um, so anyway, so I say all that to say is like for the person who really can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, do you have any kind of words of encouragement, final words of wisdom um, for those people? Yeah. And that's a great question. I, I think the the hope is always there even when we can't see it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we, I was walking with my son last night and I just, as my son gets older, he's 13. I just value this time with him so much. And so Mm. we, we were walking and and there was a beautiful moon last night and I was driving home and I could see it. And, and I said, Hey, look at the moon. And it was behind trees then. And so, uh, he could not see it, but I still knew it was there. Mm. And I think our healing is just like that. We need to get to a different place. And so what I did is I I drove two streets over where there weren't so many trees and there was the beautiful moon. It had been there all along. And so I think there are times in our healing and our recovery where there's a lot of trees Mm. and it is really hard to see that beauty, but it's still there. Um, And I tell you that because I wouldn't do my job if it wasn't. It'd be a super depressing job. Right. If it was like, hey, Jason, you're going to you're going to try to help people, but there's no chance they'll ever get better and there's no hope. (laughs) Like, well, this is sign me up. That's a tough sell. That is uh, that is a tough sell. Yeah. So so I think I think that we you know, we just need to know. And if we're faith people, we know that, you know, that that moon for us is God. And and so maybe that doesn't seem right there all the time, but it's there. And I and I really think that if I could tell people something that where I see a lot of people get stuck is to really use the growth for good. So what a lot of us do is we grow and then we use it to look back at the decisions we made and feel guilty and beat ourselves up about it because they're cringeworthy and we can't believe that our old self did it. Mm. And so that is actually not helpful growth. Like if you're just growing to hurt yourself, not awesome. So right. I would just tell you if you're in this season in this space, like use that growth and and remember that when you feel those times of regret and those moments that that's actually a sign you change for the better. Mm. Cuz you never would have noticed it otherwise. So good. Perfect note to end on. Jason, this has been such a great conversation um, and I'm just scratching the surface of, of this topic. So for everybody that is listening, please go get Jason's book, Get Past Your Past. Um, you can just read more of Jason's brilliance uh, amongst the pages of his literary work. Um, <laughs> Jason, uh, how can people best support you and connect with you? 
Yeah, so they can find me. JasonVR.com has the book and links to everything um, and all the different retailers. You can buy the book like Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all that. And it's also audiobook. So if you heard my voice today and you thought, oh, goodness, I'd like to hear hours of that. <laughs> a, I don't blame you. And B, there's an audiobook. And then the last thing I would say is if you were to go on Instagram or, or really any social media platform and look for me, it's Jason.VanRuler. Actually, make content every day about how to have better relationships. Sweet. So, if one of the things you're wrestling with is relational, um, you can hear uh, me give you quick tips every day to have better relationships. Awesome, Jason. Thanks so much for being here. You are the best. Thank you so much. I had a great time. This is awesome. I hope you loved this conversation with Jason. I learned so much. I hope you learned a lot. Would you let me know on social media? You can find me at Still Being Molly or at Can I Laugh Pod wherever you get your social medias. And would you head on over to whatever podcast app you are listening to this on and click that subscribe or follow button and take a moment to leave a review. Leaving a review really does help me to know what you're liking and how the show is personally impacting you. Thank you as always for listening. Thank you to the team at Third Wheel Media for producing the show. And for you this week, I hope something makes you laugh till you cry. We'll see you next week. Bye.